it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days and we are in the last days. What up, what up? This is Jeremy Stone from By Their Fruits. I am with my co-host, John. This is episode 57. How are you doing, John? I'm doing well. Hope everybody's doing well out there in these trying times. God bless each and every one of you. It's good to be back. Uh, I know that we said we would do it more often. We're trying. We're trying. Uh, we're busy, as I'm sure everybody else is. But we, you know, I got we, three we, episodes I got to drop now. That is true. We de- we definitely missed, uh, you know, uh, you know, talking uh and uh of course me and jeremy do talk uh um uh, you know <laughs> separately from the podcast you know we're friends at, uh, off the podcast it's not like we're opie and anthony and we only talk what we do by their fruits episodes but uh hopefully we'll be able to do it more often so yeah for real for real well it seems to be going that way man i just got to be able to balance my life where i'm able to where i'm able to consistently uh drop the episodes that we do like i said we got three of them hanging out I just got to get them in there and I'm trying to everybody else would you know normally drop one a week or so but I'm the type of guy that once I do it I'm probably just going to drop all three <laughs> see if that works I mean people seem to be into it so that is true so who, so who do we have with us today Jeremy all right we got Joe actually Joe I will let you introduce yourself um go ahead and do that and then uh Jeremy you can introduce yourself but you've you've already been on but just do it in case, and you know nobody's ever heard of you, or whatever. So, uh, Joe, who are you? What do you do? And yeah. where would you come from? Okay. Well, my name is Joe Sheehan. I am just absolutely thrilled to be here with you guys. Um, so, a little bit about myself: I am the founder and producer and director, and basically the one-man show for the Christian Underground Podcast. We are a podcast that focuses on the Christ culture and the cookies. So there's not a subject that we won't talk about on the podcast. So that's what we love to do. But my background is um, for about 10 years of my life, I was a professional political operative working for a uh, congressman, being a speechwriter, um, and then running campaigns here locally in uh, my home state and then after that i went on to be a teacher and a high school coach for 15 years and now i currently work for a nonprofit, which helps inner city students um you know basically plan out their life when they're in high school and be able to get into college and and so that's me i'm a uh, married to my high school sweetheart and we've been married for uh, going on 24 years and or 23 years excuse me and then um, we've been together 29 years. We were high school sweethearts. And then I have three daughters. So that's Dude, me. Dude, what? How old are you? you? You look like you're like maybe 35, bro. I'm 44. No way. Yeah, buddy. Born 1979. That's crazy. that's crazy. Yeah, you look young, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I thought you were our age. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, us Irishmen, and me, we age well. Which then yeah, again, I have to say that Jeremy is 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 the is he the young blood on the podcast. He's the he's the he's the he's the the young one. So uh, uh, yeah. the young buck. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's the young buck. <laughs> and then uh, we got Jeremy Anderson. What's up, buddy? It's been a long time since you've been on the show. Why don't you just give uh, people a little background about yourself? All righty. Well, I am glad to be here with my brothers and my. 
many, many year friends. Uh, John and I haven't known each other for quite as long as Jeremy and I, but see, Jeremy and I have known each other for about as long as I have been in the ministry. Uh, I am the host of the Remnant Report. I am a pastor, a researcher, um, a two-time author, and a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, Amen. Most of our videos are up on our YouTube channel. We had to create a new YouTube channel <laughs> um, because YouTube decided they were going to delete our old channel uh, like December of 2022, something like that. But um, we, we, you can find us on YouTube, uh, Kingdom Productions Network, just spelled out. And we've got the Kingdom Productions and Publishing Facebook page. And that's pretty much all that we are currently uploading. Yeah, so everybody go check that out. Also, real quick, uh, Joe, where can people find your podcast? We'll do this again at the very end, but I will do it right now. Yeah, they can find my podcast on YouTube. It is the Christian Underground Podcast. That simple, Christian Underground Podcast. Uh, we're only on YouTube right now. We're going to be working on getting out there to the other streaming services um, for you know for podcast listeners. We tried Spotify. We've got a Spotify out there. They can find like the first eight episodes on Spotify, but we'll get caught up there. But right now, it's uh, it's purely just uh, on YouTube. Okay, perfect. Well, tonight, boys, we're going to get into some end time stuff. We, It's really nothing formal. You know, uh, we don't have a talking point plan thing or whatever. We're just going to speak our minds and kind of go off the cuff. But I wanted to, at the beginning of this episode, uh, I, I kind of wanted to share some, um, you know, paranormal uh, experiences that we may have had and how, you know, I, this will end up tying into the overall conversation because in the very end, man, it's going to get real, real paranormal. Um, but yeah, if anybody want to go first, uh, share an experience or two. Sure. I'll go first. Um, All right. if you don't mind. Um, so, uh, from the time I was five years old till on and off again, till probably 41, 42, um, I have had experiences with the demonic. Um, I've been a Christian since I was 14. Um, but I would say probably from the time I was five, the first time I saw a demon, um, I was five years old. I was told to go inside my house by my mom to go get my coat because it was cold outside and, and she wanted to get going. So, I ran inside our house while my sister and my stepdad were getting ready and grabbed my coat out of a closet. Well, when I opened the closet door, uh, a demon uh, basically tried to attack me. Um, and, you know, when I was a young kid, I got my coat, ran out, things like that. Well, when you're when you're five years old and you see something like that, you think, oh, uh, you know, or when you tell adults that you see something like that, they just think you've got a really active imagination. Um but when it happens again, when you're on a pretty regular basis, you see the same entity outside your window as a kid. Um, when you have episodes of not necessarily sleep paralysis, but lucid dreaming and being uh, in the astral world when you're 10 and 11 years old, seeing the demonic in your home. Um having arguments with the demonic when you're <laughs> in your home. Um, and then, and then as you become a believer and being able to, when you're having dreams, still having kind of those lucid dreams where, um, you know, you're having, you're rebuking demons, um, right and left and, and 
doing spiritual warfare uh, in your dreams um, and seeing those same entities. And I remember um, just my whole entire life having that experience and just praying and praying and praying, God, you know, let me see the good guys at least once, <laughs> you know, um, just wanting to see that. Um, you know, just knowing that the good guys are out there and that's what I love about our Jesus is, um, you know, he doesn't have to do that, but he did. He let me see an angel just once. And I'll be honest, I'll be honest with you. Um, we get a lot of, cre it, yeah, we get a lot of credence to, uh, the demonic, you know, cause it's, it's, it's knowing your enemy. I mean, I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say that we glorify it at all because, uh, you know, telling, telling what the enemy is capable of is in glorification. It's, it's letting people know it's giving them a, you know, an intelligence report, but I will tell you, you know, this idea that, you know, they're on even footing with, with the angelic is it's no, our God is bigger. Um, his guys are better. Uh, we, we stand in a place of victory and, uh, we got we got the better army on our side. <laughs> Amen. So, Amen. Yep. Well, thank you, man. That was that's awesome that you got to see an angel, man. Like, I've heard a couple of people. There's just one guy specifically. I won't mention his name, only because I don't really believe him. But uh, he talked about that too. I don't know if what you saw was similar to his. Well, apparently his. But when you saw this angel, was it huge? Was he big? <laughs> Honestly, the thing was, um, he wasn't like this giant at all. Um, like he was more like an, a, a, a man, but the power that exuded from him was the power of our God. Right. And you just, the, the sheer magnificence of him made you terrified it's like you know when you're when you're walking down an alley and you see a guy and you know you, you know he's up to no good but then you see a police officer right kind of that that feeling of okay i got i got protection now i got a guy i this guy's got my back it's it's kind of one of those things but it's it's even magnified in that um and and the descriptions that you get of the the angelic and the word right um and i'm not talking about you know the weird <laughs> descriptions in ezekiel right i'm talking about um the description you get of, of gabriel and dan in the book of daniel or or those types of things that's what i'm talking about you know it's it, it was it was that yeah i i, I know I, I think i may know who you're talking about um and i will say like his descriptions of the demonic are pretty spot on mm -hmm. from what i've seen so there's there's a part of me that wonders if there's a little bit of truth to him and, and honestly we're probably going to have him on the podcast if, if it's the guy that i'm thinking of. we can talk about it after we're done here but um if it's that guy but yeah um some of the other stuff i'm a little more i'm a, a little more maybe non plus about but uh a little more skeptical, yeah. But um, maybe there there might be you know a little psychosis there. Maybe I don't know. Um, but but the things that like if you want to know what I saw um, regarding the angelic, go read the descriptions of the angelic and Daniel. If you want to know what I saw, and, and and that's why I know it was God, is because I can go to His Word and I can confirm it, right? right? Okay, if you want to know the demonic, go read the description of the creatures that are coming out of the abyss in Revelation 9. And, I mean, I didn't see a tail like a scorpion, but I saw the face of a man with the mouth of a lion trying to bite my head off when I was five years old. Jeez, dude, that would have been terrifying. Yeah, it was. It been Trust terrifying. me, it was. Um, I mean, I I grabbed my coat and ran. 
I mean, it was that fast. I mean, it was, right. it, and, and that's the thing I keep seeing. And, and the things that when I talk to people who've actually seen the demonic, you know, that I trust when I, when I give them those descriptions, like when I look outside my window, okay. So it's the face of a man, but it's incredibly emaciated. Like it's like the skeleton of a man or the mouth of a lion um and then it's got the the one that was assigned to me I, that's the only thing i can think of is he was assigned to me was he had glowing red eyes and and he he looked like death is the only way to describe him i mean he just absolutely looked like death um and he would smile this just evil evil smile where you would see his fangs and his that mouth and I just, but what was funny is growing up with that and then knowing that I have the victory and, and experiencing that victory and understanding what it means to have the presence of God and understand what it means to have the name of God. Um, I mean, guys, they're, they're just worms, man. They are. They're just worms, you know. And the people who give them power, if they, if they knew who they were, you know, if they knew who these, these entities are, that they, they give power over their life that are, that they're allowing to draw, to drag them to the pit of hell. Right. Especially they would never. To, to an angel, you know? Yes. Yes. Especially compared to comparison to just the majestic nature of an angel. Right. You know, now I'm not saying that there aren't the angels that look that look like. I mean, I do believe in the hierarchy of angels. I do believe that there are different angels. As a matter of fact, speaking of angels, I'm actually studying Dr. Heiser's book right now on, on angels. Um, my daughter and I Good actually, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. Um, and my daughter and I are actually studying it together. We're doing it as as a Bible study together. And but it's. Yeah, I mean, if you understood just and and the thing is is they're created even they're they're created beings which means they are lower than God and Christ, you know, and and Jesus and the Godhead, they are lower than the Trinity. If they if if you if you could just grasp it. Like anyone who's listening to this right now and who might be experiencing demonic oppression Understand that the angels that God has given you the power to command through Christ that is within you. One angel can send a thousand to flight. Two can send 10,000 to flight. And it's not talking about people. It's talking, it's not talking about these mortal beings. It's talking about the demonic. Guys, we are, we, we we fight from victory, and if people would just know that, anyways, I'm I'm done. <laughs> no, that was great, man. I I know what you're saying too. It's like the only way that they really overcome people is through fear, because mm -hmm. they just weaken. You know that fear really gets you in a place where you're you're able to be overcome. You know what I mean? I'm not saying like a Christian could be possessed. I'm just saying in general, like you get overcome whether it's through oppression or if you're not saved, you know, through possession. It's that fear, and they have so many different layers and tactics that they use to keep you in that fear or to put you in that fear, you know what I mean? And that's the only way that they win. They're like a bunch of bullies, dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if you were to stand up to them, they wouldn't be so tough anymore. Well, it, you know, if you're a Christian, it'd be a, probably a bad idea if you're not a Christian to, to try to do that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it, There's a reason why even people who – aren't saved when they use the name of Jesus against these things, these things flee. Yeah, it works. And people like it literally works. witches will admit that dude. And they're still not Christians. I don't understand it. They're, they basically, mm -hmm. they know that there's power in the name of Jesus and they just willingly don't mm -hmm. accept him. Well, I, that blows my mind, but you know. Yeah. It's up here, man. It's up here. And, and the th the only thing that gives them any kind of advantage over us is our own ignorance and the fact that they are just 
millennia older than us. That's it. All right. That also reminds me of like um, a bunch of, you know, you, you hear these stories all the time in, in abduction uh, with the abduction phenomenon, you know, like mm. this person's not a Christian, but the only thing they could think of to do out of fear was to call in the name of Jesus. And then that experience automatically stopped, mm -hmm. you know, yep. it, being a very logical person, at least in, in my opinion, I'm a pretty logical person is if that worked and you're suffering with this type of phenomenon, why would you not give your life to Christ? Mm -hmm. But then again, mm -hmm. you know, Satan has my, blinded the minds of those who don't believe. So it's like, it's this weird paradigm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll, I'll actually I'm gonna hold on to that thought because that actually goes into one of my experiences. But uh, who wants yeah. to go next? John? Jeremy? Um, I guess I will. Um, okay. I, and, I, and I would argue, too, in a lot of those cases, um, I, I believe it's the person... It, uh, I haven't heard the story of someone actually calling out to Jesus and it, it being kind of like mockery and it still works. I would argue that even if a person is unsaved and they're in that moment, you know, trying, you know, to rely on Jesus. Right. Like um, that moment of sincerity. Yeah. I think God grants them through that faith, no matter how weak it is at that moment, for lack of a better words. Because I don't necessarily think it's necessarily just saying Jesus' name in and of itself. Uh, because it reminds me of a New Ager, a former New Ager that I used to be. That's kind of like you hear you hear a lot of, I, I you know, it's it's kind of like a something that I I'm all, I'm mull over and think about a lot. Uh, you know, because the, the the name itself, I mean, we know that the, the, the demons know scripture. We know that they could you know recite it as well too, right? So. You know, if a person, you know, if God chooses to have mercy on that person and, you know, and, and in that moment they reach out to him, then I think that's what repels the demonic activity or any issues that they're having is that specifically and not necessarily the words that they're saying in above themselves. Now, I could be wrong. It could be up for debate, but that's just how I, that's how I look at it as a former new ager. I think that I think scripturally, yeah. biblically, that's how it is. Um, well, John, I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you because, because here's the thing. If we, if we actually, um, Mike Heiser did a really great podcast on his naked Bible podcast on the name of God. Right. And what that means, and so what you just said and what you just hit on, I think is absolutely right. It's the name of God is actually a number, is, is another way of saying the presence of God. And the name of Jesus is the same thing. Dude, it's the presence of Christ. Already. Like, I can come in your name. Like, if you say, take this to so-and-so for me, you know, and you take the letter or whatever it is to the person. You're doing it, in, or I'm doing it in your name. And, yes. you know, I, if it's like a situation with a Christian and Jesus, that the person whose name we come in is the king of kings. And so that, you know, the, the, there's power in the name of Jesus. Like if you are in Jesus. Yes, and, uh, yeah, I would I would say that would be a person's faith, um, but I'm yeah. saying I'm ar arguing someone who does not believe. Absolutely, um, absolutely. but 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 in that moment of sincerity, <laughs> reaches out to God. Um, you know, God, you know, God said, "I'll show m mercy on whom I show mercy to." You know, so I, you know, I, I think you know because. I'm not saying there's a lot of when we talk about this, there's many Christians will just say, and I do believe there is there there is, um, like you're saying, there's there's power in the presence of God and Jesus, and there's obviously, um, and and they're they're powerful and above themselves, um, but you know, it, it, when Christians say there's power in the name of Jesus, unless we clarify what we mean a lot, you know, cause you have Russell brand right now with his faux baptism. Right. And he's going around and he's like, they're saying it's like your intention. It's like your words, you know? And so we got to be kind of like careful in us saying that because a lot of new agers will think that they can just use Jesus's name as like casting some sort of magic spell, 
you know, yeah, and, I understand that, and I understand that most Christians don't mean that when they say that, obviously I know that, mm -hmm. but as a former new ager, that's what they'll, that's what they'll, you know, they'll look at that as being, being that, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, and I, I, you know, and so when most Christians say it, I don't immediately jump to thinking that's what they mean. Uh, because mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it's not what they mean. Now you'll get, might be some hyper Pentecostal, uh, people <laughs> where, you know, they take it too far to the extreme, right. You know, um, uh, yeah, where you kind of like word of faith type stuff. Right. You know, um, mm -hmm. but, but so I guess for me, I'm always, um, because my faith is very logical. So I'm always in, in the back of my mind going, okay, so are there any, like, like, I believe in the supernatural, obviously, like, like I do, um, you know, my, my thought processes are very metaphysical. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, like a, uh, 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 what's the name of the word for like, um, no, like Thomas Hobbes, like the type of thinking where you can only know what's right, right, what's right in front of your face. Um, I'm not that way at all. Materialist? Uh, yeah, materialist. Yes. So I'm not a materialist. I am a metaphysical type thinker, but I, I still question the, the supernatural experiences that I've had in my life, even when I was a new ager to when I, now me being a born again Christian. Right. So I've had, you know, very, I have talked about it on the show before, um, I, before I was born again, I would have, um, uh, sleep paralysis. Um, and, um, and, uh, since I have, you know, um, become born again, I've no longer had that at all. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, I know that, you know, there, there, there are physical reasons why a person has, uh, sleep paralysis. There, there are supernatural reasons why a person has sleep paralysis. Just because someone's born again necessarily doesn't mean that God will directly deliver them from that. They could still be demonized from a supernatural mm -hmm. standpoint. They still have sleep paralysis. They could still have physical reasons why they're having sleep paralysis as well, too. We discussed that in a previous show. Um, but you know, there, there's some things that I, I still can't explain from a materialist like logical standpoint things that have to be supernatural at least i believe they're likely in my life right so one time um my my, my um my family and i were going uh to um like kind of like this arcade uh that's nearby called fun 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 and i stopped to get gas and all of a sudden this guy out of nowhere like literally out of nowhere approaches me and he gets kind of like really up close to me and he starts talking to me and I'm like, okay, like there's something off about this guy. Like I can't put exactly what's off, like off with him, you know? And so, you know, and, and, but he seems like he's drunk, but I can't smell alcohol, you know? Um, and he seems like he's homeless, but then again, he has like a lot of like, um, like fine jewelry on, you know? And so I'm talking with him and, you know, he's kind of like just, he's not being rude, but he's, he, but he, he wasn't being aggressive yet at that time. It was just odd, but his eyes kept doing this weird thing where they kept darting back and forth, back and forth, which makes me think, you know, obviously he was on some sort of mind altering substance, but, um, towards the end of the conversation, when I was about to go back in, into the car after pumping my gas, all of a sudden he looks right at me. And this is, this is when I, I this is why I believe he's demonically possessed. He goes, only God can judge me. You can't judge me. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, you know, and I've been nice to him the whole entire time. You know, it was uncomfortable. The whole conversation was extremely uncomfortable, but it wasn't like I was being rude to him or anything. I try to be nice to people as I possibly can. Uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, uh, Jeremy Anderson can attest to this, there's a, there's a little bit of polity down here in the South, right? People are, are usually cordial even when they're not cordial or nice people generally, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, I, so, and then, and I was like, okay, that's really odd. And then, and then like his eyes, like they were just like the weirdest, like, <sighs> there's something off about the color, the color like changed or something in his eyes. And he was like staring me down and he was like, you know, I could kill you right now if I wanted to. And so all of a sudden I was like, I just started praying like, because I couldn't think of anything else to do. And and then all, he just all of a sudden just backed off and just started running. Mm. Uh. And and I was like, OK, OK, you know, and so. 
and I've talked to, I mean, my wife's, my wife's a, a, a non-believer, you know, and, and, but she was there, she was in the passenger seat, she had the window down and she was, you know, kind of witnessing everything. Right. So I get, I get back in the car and I'm like, you know, that was odd, you know? And, and, and she was like, you know, I, I thought that, um, she was like, well, yeah, he seemed like me, maybe I thought that she, he was, you know, she was thinking he was on, you know, some mind altering substance or drugs as well too. Right. But then she was like, I, I felt something really off about him too, you know? And, and I, and so it's, it's situations like that, that I've had in my life that I can't really explain outside of it just being like, like demons like either de people being demonically possessed coming up to me uh and just i mean there's other stories that i can tell that really don't make any sense outside of that um or stories that my dad who was a born again believer i guess real quick something that happened to him was i was born three months premature um i should not be alive i was born dead uh, me too um, it was 1985. It was a whole different time, you know. Like they had to rush my mom, who had systemic lupus. Um, which she was a born again believer. They wanted her to abort me because they didn't know what habit carrying a baby when someone had lupus at the time, what would it put her through that she would die or that I would die. But you know, she was staunchly pro life, so thank God she chose not to abort me. Obviously, I would not be here. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so my um, so my dad got separated from the ambulance. Uh, uh, following it up to the University of Chapel Hill, uh, which because they had a needle natal unit there, but they didn't have one in Kafer Valley in Fayetteville. And he got lost and separated from the ambulance. And then his car broke down and he was like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, like I, I got to get up to Chapel Hill. Well, um, uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, a, a guy in a truck pulled out of nowhere. I came up to him and, you know, and, and so he goes, um, I forgot exactly what my dad said was wrong with his car, with the Toyota Corolla, but somehow the guy was like able to like fix whatever was wrong, like really quickly and get my dad back on the road. I don't remember what exactly happened and I can't ask my father. He's deceased. Um, but it wasn't like a tire had blown or anything like that. I remember that. And then the guy looked at my dad and he goes, you're having a, a, a child, right? And my dad was like, "Yeah, well, how did you know? I'm, 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 I'm going up to the hospital." And and, and the guy looks at me, goes, "Well, he's going to be a healthy baby boy. He's going to be, he's going to be safe. Don't worry. Uh, everything's in God's hands. Everything's going to be okay." And and my my dad just thought that was really odd. Just like, how did he know? Like, and, and so my, my dad asked him, was like, "Well, like." How do you know? And he was like, "Well, God wanted me to tell you that that that, that you know that 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 that's what's going to happen." And and so my dad got back in the car. He drove on. Now, my dad thinks that may have been some sort of angelic manifestation. I don't know. OK, he used to he used to talk about it just because there's other odd things. I can't remember offhand. I was a child. I was a teenager when my dad told me this story. I, I can't ask him now. Um, but um, it, it, there's stories like this, like he had stories like that, you know, and I guess, you know, some some Christians do have more of a um kind of like more of a supernatural things happen to them than other christians do um but yeah that you know there's probably more that i could tell uh things that have happened to me some things happened to me when i was a new ager that were strictly completely demonic um that that is for sure um but i will say that the times that i have been confronted with people that I believe were demonically possessed or the times that I think I was demonically oppressed. Um, it was definitely when I resisted the sin or resisted the temptation or, you know, when I prayed for the person or I prayed, you know, like the guy at the gas station, I was like, you know, I was praying and I was even speaking out loud, but I don't think he could hear me, you know, that if there was a demon to, to leave that man and for God to have mercy on him and stuff like that and everything. And, you know, in, in, in every, you know, every time, and this is how I know God is real. Every time where I've ever been thought that I was being demonized or thought that I was in front of someone who was demonically possessed and I either resisted the temptation or the sin or, or prayed to God, it, it stopped. It, it stopped. Mm -hmm. 
So, the, I mean, scripturally, that's what it says we're supposed to do. Resist, resist the devil, and the devil will flee, right? And so, mm-hmm. um, and there will be a story I'll probably tell later on the podcast of another experience I had where I knew the guy was democratically possessed and I was being tempted. And it wasn't even a temptation. The devil should have known. It wasn't a temptation that I would even not even do. But yet it was still there. And I turned it down and the guy left. So it's just stuff like that where it's 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 just it's just it's just it, it, it's again, it's either having faith and resisting or 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 not giving in a temptation and resisting. And doing those things, it stops it. Um and I'm not saying that I don't have trials and tribulations. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying, you know, God chastises those who are who whom he loves, but you know, and so I, I guess I'm rambling. I don't want to ramble too much longer, but um, it's just that there are times where I think we're supernatural, but again, I I, I don't hundred percent know that they were. Um, From the outside I, looking in, it sounded pretty supernatural. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I think that they are, but again, I, I just I don't know. If, I don't know for you know. I, it's not like. I've had a, a a demon or an angel manifest in front of me that I could be like, okay, that's exactly what that is, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm sure mm-hmm. that there have been people that I came across that are demonically possessed. I'm I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure about that. Um, but then again, you know, what's the fine line between demonic possession and mental illness and drug drug addiction? Now, drugs do open you up to demonic uh possession. Um, yeah. mental illness can too, you know. So, yeah, well, and there's also stories in the Bible that even though it's a material thing that's going on, like the gentleman that was at the gas station, he could have been on drugs. He could have, I mean, all of those things are there, but there are stories in the Bible where, you know, Elijah prays that, or Elisha praise that the eyes of the servant are open and when the servant's eyes are open he sees the army of god you know uh, police officers are will tell you story after story after story of and different police officers will tell you different stories where they go into a room or a warehouse to clear it and they're clearing the warehouse and they finally arrest the guy that they're trying to clear because they're they're going after, you know, someone who's broken into this warehouse or broken into a bar or whatever. And, you know, they get the guy in the back of the car and the guy in the back of the car says, Hey man, who is that other guy that was with you? And they're like, nobody. I was in there by myself. And they're like, no, dude, there was this big guy that was standing there with you. (laughs) <laughs> and if he hadn't been there, man, I would have jumped you in a heartbeat. And, you know, so there's, there's stories like that. So that's what I'm saying is like, that could have been a material thing. That could have been a guy totally stoned out, whacked out of his mind. And your prayers still manifested or I hate to use that term, but your prayers still brought forth the protection, the divine protection of God. And sent him, sent him running, you know, and you don't know what that guy saw when you were praying. I have no idea. I I, I don't know. I would, it was the faith of me praying and, or, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and praying for him, you know, that Mm -hmm. I think that's what drove either him away or drove the demons inside of him away. Uh, Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. I, I, I've heard you tell that story a couple of times and, you know, I think it's, definitely more probable than not that he was possessed and i'm pretty sure i've heard the other story as well um i'll have to wait here you tell it to know for sure but i know you you told me um two different uh, uh things before but as far as i'm concerned i have never experienced anything as an adult other than the night I got saved and 
I think it was very, very probable that I was possessed myself um, when I got saved, you know, being that I was um, battling a several year drug addiction. You know, I, there was a lot of, of spiritual activity that was going on in my house that night. Um, there were things that I saw that may have really been there or may not have been there, you know, just, <laughs> but I know when I, when I, cause that's the first time in my life that I cried out, you know, audibly for Jesus to please save me. And those were my words. And he had been dealing with my heart for long time and I had been running from him since uh since I left Fayetteville. Um I went from being enrolled in seminary in Fayetteville to and uh teaching the youth at the church that my wife and I had been at for several years to refusing to go to church and before I knew it, back on the streets selling and then being addicted to drugs after my son died. And I, um, you know, I, I have experienced both sides of it. I've experienced um, both sides of what you see in Christianity, I experienced, I mean, you know, I lived it for many, many years, um, pretending to be this great Christian. And I was on Sunday and Wednesday, but the rest of the week, I had more than one foot in the world. And, you know, that's why I know that I never was truly born again until, you know, that, that night on October the 28th when I finally cried out for the Lord to save me and, uh, you know, immediately all the spiritual activity that was going on disappeared. My, it was like a dam broke inside of me. I, it was uh, 2016 and I hadn't cried since my son passed away in 2012, and I had—that's a you know a long, a long time to hold in that that deep of a hurt, and it just—it was a cry that was not like you see on TV. I mean, it was loud and nasty and snotty and um, I, and it, it was cleansing and it was like there were these pair of arms around me. I, I, you would have had to literally be me experiencing it to understand what I mean. I, it was like I, all all of the hurt that I had felt and had caused, because I caused quite a bit of pain to my family as well, but it was like all of that was taken from me in that time. And before then, um, anyone who's listened to the Remnant Report since it was started in uh, late 2018, may have heard the story when my mom actually came on the program for Halloween to talk about the night that the witch coven came after my family. My mom had um, won one of the witches to the Lord and all of them came after her and were going to kill her. And this was 
right near Halloween, and it was on Halloween night that they all got together and, like, threw everything they had at my family. And everything that I saw, and I saw some things that night, and heard things, um, I had to have my mom to give me context because, like, this was before cell phones, of course, you know. I'm 40 years old, so when I was nine, there definitely were no cell phones, but we did have answer machines. They They were automated things that had tapes in them, and these people had called so many times that night that eventually mom took the phone off the hook. But before she did, uh, there was a message that was left on the machine. And my mom, I don't know what she did with it, but I'd actually like to know. Um, I don't know, I have to remember to ask her that. But one of her best friends committed suicide when they were teenagers and I mean they were best friends from the time they were in uh, like first grade all the way up until he committed suicide at like 16 so it was not like she would have mistaken it. And it's not like today where you can deep fake certain things. Um, I don't know how it could be explained other than really happening. Um, I guess somebody that sounded like him could have called, but he was saying things that, my mom said nobody other than her, Mark, or my dad, who died when I was three, so he was no longer alive. Um, nobody but the three of them would have known to say the things that this voice that sounded exactly like Mark. And, you know, we know that the dead are not able to call from hell. Um, one time in the Bible, God allowed the spirit of Samuel to be conjured up by the, the witch of Endor. And I mean, it was almost like she knew that it was demons masquerading as spirits every other time because the fact that it was actually Samuel shocked her. Right. And right. yeah, so I, I know that this wasn't Mark, it was a demon, and mm -hmm. um, he, but he, you know, talked in his voice and talked about things that only Mark or my mom or my dad or a demon would know. Now, demons aren't able to, uh, they're not all knowing like God is, but, you know, like uh, it was either Joe or John said earlier, you know, that they live, well, I mean, they all die. You know, they've been alive for at least 5,000 years. You know, they've been wandering the earth, depending on what your particular view of demons and where they come from is. Um, you know, the youngest they could be was, you know, the, the time of the flood. Mm -hmm. So I believe that just like we see in Daniel and in Ephesians 6, you know, there are principalities over certain cities and, you know, G, G what's the word, geographical <laughs> locations of and, you know, like principalities over like the prince of Persia and the, the prince of Greece that withstood Daniel. We know that there's a hierarchy and we know that there are um, principalities that are assigned over, you know, places like that. But they they could also be assigned to people because Satan can't be everywhere at once either. 
he's simply an angel. And so, you know, the only way he's going to be able to get information on people the way God does is, and he would be getting information because he is the accuser of the brethren and there's no way for him to accuse people unless he knows what they've done. But, you know, he can use angels to watch over, uh, be a sign, not watch over, but, you know, be a sign to, say, a family for generations. And then you know what their their grandmother's grandmother's grandmother did. And, yeah. you know, it's a way that psychics are able to tell you all these things that the spirit supposedly said of your dead ancestors because you know this is a demon mm-hmm. and yep uh, you know other than that night that's that is the only bad thing that has happened demonically like with the witch coven trying to kill my mom and my stepdad and my brothers and my sister and it the end of the night, we all we we were all in the same room. That's the only time I've ever seen my stepdad scared in the thirty six years he's been in my life. Um, you know, I've, I've never seen him scared other than that night. And the next morning, the lady. The, the head of the witch coven, who is a Christian herself now, um, this whole thing literally led her to the Lord. They did um, every spell that they had, every black magic, left-handed path, ritual that they could do to kill her. It was their mission that night to kill my mother. And... Um, this lady told my mom that uh, she's seen this spell done a lot to a, le- a lesser degree and kill people many times from distances. And these people were not even a mile from where I'm sitting right now because... If you've seen the videos from the Revolutionary War graveyard that's about a mile from my house, that's where all the witch covens still do their rituals. They they come from all over this area to do their rituals about a mile from my house. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I live in the, the country in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's not even a gas station for about 20 miles. So I live in six to say the least, but there is that revolutionary war site. And uh, where I live now is only a few miles from where I grew up at. And so we weren't far, but she told my mom the next morning that, no matter how hard they tried, they could not break through the barrier of whatever power was protecting my house. Now, they killed my dad's hunting dogs. He had um, a pen in the backyard full of walkers. I mean, he had like 10 hunting dogs that were very expensive and... All of them weren't dead, but it's actually it's weird that the the dog that I remember vividly because it was the one that was hanging the next morning in the backyard. Um, his name was Samson, <laughs> and wow. that's the, my dad had this thing about, or my stepdad. Um, he had this thing about naming dogs after or naming everything really after biblical characters. And he named that dog Samson. And, um, that, that, the dog I remember seeing, but, um, 
you know, everything that happened, it was demon possessed people doing it, you know? Um, it, it wasn't, it was like your situation, John, you know, like I, I didn't see the demons myself and there were a lot of things that happened. The lights went off a million times um, throughout the course of the night. There were all kind of sounds. There were definitely people outside, but, or, or at least it sounded like there were people outside messing around out there. But, you know, that could have been from witchcraft too. Who knows? But I, I don't think that they could have, I don't think that, that they had the power to do what they did to Samson the dog from a distance. That's something that's going to take people, I think. And I, I realize that Satan and demons in witchcraft give these people a certain amount of power, but I don't know how much they're able to do from a distance. I know that I, and I've actually been looking just to make sure from all the time, you know, I was listening to you guys and uh, I have not found a, you know, a single instance in the Bible of a demon doing something to somebody on its own. Now they're, I'm sure you can find something in, you know, uh, some of the Jewish Targums or the Zohar or somewhere like that, but, or even, you know, extra biblical literature, maybe. But what about, um, what about that, 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 um, where those two guys go in to cast out the demon or, well, I, I've, actually that that, I, I've actually got that pulled up. That's what I was going to say about oh, okay. earlier about the, the power of um, when y'all were talking about the power of Jesus name and whatnot. Um, you know, these guys were Jewish exorcists and you talking about Acts 19, I'm assuming. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. The um, sons of Sceva, the, the Jewish exorcist. The demons themselves didn't do anything. It was the demon possessed people um, that attacked them. They overpowered them. It says, um, it's right here in Acts nineteen eleven. It says God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and. The evil spirits went out, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place at, attempted to name over those who had evil spirits, attempted to cast out those who had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of of one Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was in leaped onto them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So, yeah, demons definitely give people power, for sure. Physical power, um, you know, supernatural power. But I don't, I don't know what power they have to do anything on the physical without a physical body. Um, that's actually a good, that's that, actually a good point. You know, because I myself like um, something I want to mention real quick, Jeremy, to, to what you're saying is, is, is um, when I was a new ager, I was pretty sure there were times where I was demonically possessed, whether I realized it or not, uh, at times where I believe I was probably demonic uh, possessed by a, a, a spirit of divination, uh, you know, because there were times where I would divine just 
the most insane like cosmology or have like insane you know thoughts uh in my head um you know that were that were it was complete just utter nonsense of course you're reflecting on it now but you know you would have kind of like I, I would always have the feeling of like um when I say the third eye is it would always very tingle or would hurt uh when I was a new ager um and the moment that I became born again the moment I was delivered with for, from whatever demons that were inside of me and I never saw them leave me um but um I felt that that the hug you were talking about that intense love of the holy spirit I mean I was weeping I was crying like you said like I was full of snot and everything the moment that I uh became born again you know the more I had faith and truly believed um, you know, I, I was, I was saw, and I felt that intense love is, which is still the same love that I feel today. Um, when I'm, when I'm, um, you know, deep in worship, this like the feeling of the Holy Spirit is the best, best way I could put it. Um, and, and not once have I had that tingling or third eye sensation ever. And also I'll say this, I was able to quote unquote speak in tongues when I was a new ager, mm. have autoglossia. But now since I've been born again, don't have it at all. Don't have it at all. Now take that with what you will. I, I'm just, I just, I, I'm just saying, that I, I don't have it. I don't have it. And it's you not that I'm not God. emotional. It's not that I, you know, it's because I think most speaking in tongues, and I think you have a born again believer who speaks in tongues. Too. I think it's like it's out of gloss yet. It's just like it's emotionality that ends up kind of like um, confusing uh, synapses within the brain and causes you kind of to like just speak in like autopilot you know and i'm not a cessationist like i still believe the gifts of the spirit exist but i think speaking in tongues is just language just tongues is just language you know so you know i i um but you know i i i no longer can do that but when i was a new ager i could easily just and it wasn't just like i was trying to do it i, I can easily i can easily do it and i can remember trying to do it as a kid because there's a brief time that my dad went to a pentecostal church and I thought I was a believer at the time. I was not born again. I was raised in a church, but I thought I loved the Lord. And and uh, I, I couldn't do it as a kid. But when I was a new Asia and I was, I believe, filled with a, a spirit of divination, that's when I was able to speak in tongues. And oh. and and so, you know, I good to go to Jeremy Anderson's point is that love that you felt, man, that hug, that love that was different than any love I've ever felt in my entire life. That was the moment that I became born again. And like I said, at that moment, I no longer, I've, I've, I have not had any delusions. I don't divine anymore. Obviously. Um, I, my, I don't, I don't feel the same thing that I feel up here on my forehead anymore at all, period. Um, and I think that's demonic. I think it's straight up demonic. Well, similarly, um, I used to be, or well, I was diagnosed as an epileptic because I used to have seizures. Um, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had one since uh, that time um, at all. Not, not one. And hmm. you know, think of that of what you will. God could have healed me from it. He could. But, he could. Have, he could have delivered it from from you. You know. Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. But we also see in, you know, just in context. Jesus, the demons he and the apostles were casting out, a lot of times were causing infirmities. That's true, and, yes. You know, says, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not saying that I believe that every time someone is sick, it's a demon. But I, mm -hmm. I do believe that um, demons can make someone the same sickness, you know, the same everything, I think, that they are able to manipulate spirit um, the same way because I mean that's what that's what magic technically the the definition and I don't have it in front of me but I've I've read it a million times is basically to uh, to manipulate the physical uh, by using the I'm inserting my word here, spiritual. It doesn't say spiritual. I think it says something like mystical or something like that. But it, it's it's not. It, it's it's trying to make your will supersede God's will is what it's an yeah. attempt is trying to be. It's I don't need you, God. I can do it myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, 
I believe that that demons are able to definitely cause things to cause a reaction or whatever, however you want to define it to happen in the the physical world. But I um, I I don't know how much they themselves are able to do with without people like in in revelation 9 when we see the the creatures that come out of the the bottomless pit um it it gives us a description first and then it it tells us about the the king they have over them the angel of the bottomless pit who is described further down in revelation uh 17 and 18 when it talks about when it goes back to revelation 9 it talks about the the beast and the woman um we see that the the beast that comes up out of the the bottomless pit is the the antichrist or who we call the antichrist you know the beast that the angel is um giving john a uh, further explanation of you know he's talking about the beast that was um is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit um so i, I don't I don't know if the things that come out of the bottomless pit could rightly be described as, as demons. They're definitely um, on the demonic side of things, you know. Um, but I don't think they're disembodied spirits of dead Nephilim. <laughs> um, dead chimeras, it, bro. Yeah, they're definitely yeah. chimera. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, well, can I... I would like to speak into something, um, and it's it's really, I mean, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's more anecdotal than anything else because it's personal experience, but you were talking about that you don't know how much um, the demonic can actually do on their own without people. Um, so going back to my, yeah, uh, I would say they can up into the point of actually killing a person. Um, I don't know if they can do that. And the reason why I would say that is because not only ha have I experienced the demonic my entire life, I also experienced a haunting um, in a home that I lived in. Um, and I, I believe very strongly that it was the demonic trying to drive a wedge between my, my wife and I. Um, we, we didn't have any children. We were newlyweds. Um, but there were things that were going on in my home that do not, um, they cannot be just explained away with, um, uh, materialist rationalization. Um, yeah, well, I, I agree. Oh, yeah. I said the same thing that night. I, I, I believe yeah. wholeheartedly. Well, and then I've also experienced physical touch of the demonic. Um, and my daughter has experienced the physical touch of the demonic. Um, when we were in a certain place and in, in those types of things, but, but yeah. And I mean, so, but I, I like, I agree it's easier for them. And then when you talk to people like Karen Wilkinson um, from stolen seed, uh, evil harvest or people who um, have experienced that sleep paralysis um, where an entity has actually revealed itself and has come into those. They, you know, that that is a disembodied spirit that is oppressing them, either incubi or succubi. Um, we have historical record of incubi and succubi throughout um, human experience, especially when we're looking at the issue of sleep paralysis and those types of things. Uh, in fact, even the spirit Lilith, Lilith or Lilith in um, the book of Isaiah is also believed to be have been a um, incubi or succubi um, yeah. 
or incubus or succubus spirit. And, and for anyone listening who doesn't know what an incubus or succubus is, these are entities that visit in the night that are believed to um, partake in sexual or um, sexual encounters with either male or female. Uh, incubi are with um, females and succubi are with males. This is where we get the whole vampiric um genre of of um mythology and and the only reason why i know this and, and i want to give a shout out to to dr judd burton but um, say that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. um i'm actually taking his preternatural class right now and <laughs> so yeah. that kind of stuff's like right here right <laughs> in the brain but um but yeah and so so when we're looking at that um I, I think, you know, yeah, when we look at the scripture, I don't know how much we can find in canon of um, of the, the demonic doing something in and of like itself, out, right, outside of um, what we see in the book of Revelation. Um but I do think, you know, in the pseudepigrapha and the apocrypha, you see, at least in the book of Enoch, um, you do see that interaction between the spiritual and the physical. And and I know that Timothy Alberino has, um, you know, he kind of takes a very materialist viewpoint when it comes to the, the, the melding of those two realms. But I do believe that, you know, the spiritual can manifest itself in the physical. That's just what, that's, a, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, well, that's actually, that whole thing is a good transition because one of my stories is about sleep paralysis. Um, but yeah, I agree. I was going to say that too. I, I agree with Jeremy that, uh, you know, the Bible, it doesn't, he's right. Like it doesn't uh, expressly state or have any examples of demons, you know, hurting somebody without using another body, but like you anecdotal stories there's, there's so many stories man uh of people being you know touched or scratched i, I do just want to say this real quick um that doesn't mean that there isn't uh spiritual forces that can't do anything just the very bottom of the barrel demons you know disembodied spirits we have fallen angels that are here on earth and they are spiritual beings and I believe that we can see from scripture that they are able to manifest both physically and uh, supernaturally, uh, spiritually. And so, you know, the things that are happening, you know, they can be, they really can be explained from scripture without it being an act, like the, uh, a disembodied spirit, you know, doing it. That's not me saying, you know, that you're wrong. They can't. I, you know, I, I don't know, but I'm just saying that it can be explained from scripture, you know, just with it, and it be demonic. Just that it's a higher form of demonic, and that it's a fallen angel. Well, that. That's an interesting point as well. Yeah, I got. I I think that demons can, but you're. I know what you're saying. You're saying there's different. There's there's probably a plethora of entities out there. You know what I mean? That fall into the demonic realm. Some powerful, more powerful than the others. You know what I mean? That type of thing. But um, I have uh I have two stories. So and one of them um is about sleep paralysis, which is actually both of them will be. I'll just keep it at that because we're running out of time here. Uh, one of the first the one of the first um memories in my life that I'll like never forget. You know, everybody has like a couple memories I'll just never forget, you know what I mean? That type of thing. It doesn't have to be traumatic, just in general. Something that impacted you so much, you know what I mean, that you'll never forget that that happened. Well my first memory that uh stuck with me my whole life like that is is during there's something that happened during a sleep paralysis uh episode. And I, every, well, maybe not everybody, but anybody who's listening to this show who's, you know, been listening for a long time already knows because we had a three hour podcast on sleep paralysis with Vicky Joy Anderson and 
you know, me and John had like three, four other people on. And uh, so you can go back and, and listen to that as well if you want. There's tons of sleeper houses, uh, testimonies within there. But the one that really affected me the most um, in a negative way was when, and I, I, I suffered just for a little background, I suffered with sleep paralysis from the time I was, you know, seven, eight years old, all the way until I was 19. And I'm not talking about like here and there. I'm talking about like my brother and I, my twin, we suffered with it every, like four, maybe four out of seven days of the week for 11 years. You know, a long time until we got born again, actually, is when they all is when they stopped. Um, I've only had it maybe three, four times. You know, I was born again at 19 and I'm going to be 31. I've probably had it like four times, maybe. And every single one of those times it got stopped in the name of Jesus. Um, but uh, so one night I was I was going to bed. My brother and I, my twin, we shared a room. We had a bunk bed. You know, we'd switch off every night who was on top, who was on bottom. And we were suffering uh, from paralysis so badly that uh, we would literally take turns um, watching each other go to bed in case we saw a sign of a struggle. Because when you're when you're in that state, you can't say anything. You can't do anything. You know, you're yelling, but all that comes out is a breath of air. You know what I mean? And your eyes are flickering. All this stuff is crazy. It's, it's a terrifying experience. Um, so we used to do that. But one night, you know, we ended up falling asleep. I'm on the top, top bunk. And all I just knew, because when I go into sleep, when I, when I have sleep paralysis and when I suffered with it, I could tell it was going to happen. Like you can feel it coming on. It's a weird, it's a weird feeling. You're just, you're laying there, you're, you're tired. And all of a sudden you get this feeling and you're like, oh no, here it comes. Here we go. You know what I mean? And then you go into it and it's just nuts. So I'm in, I, I get sleep paralysis and I'm laying on the top bunk and I'm trying to yell out for my brother. I'm trying to, you know, have him wake me up, like, you know, shake me or something because I was, anybody knows anything about sleep paralysis, you're consciously awake, but you, you're in this paralyzed state. You know, um, I, I, I always felt like a demon was on my chest. Um, I've never physically uh, you know, seen a demon. I've never seen them manifest themselves, but I knew like it was like a, one of those knowings where you know that you know that you know, and you can have like this picture in your head of what it looks like and all this stuff while it's happening. So I guess in a way, it's kind of, in my opinion, kind of revealing itself to you or what it looks like. But I'm 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 in the middle of having an episode, and then all of a sudden, somebody comes into my room and picks me up off the top bunk. Now, in my mind, I think it must be my grandfather because um, uh, I was probably about 10 or 11, maybe 12 at this when I was having this experience. And at that time, I was suffering with like a small bladder. So I, you know, I'd pee the bed or whatever. So I thought that my grandpa was coming in there to like walk me down to the bathroom or, you know, bring me down to the bathroom so that wouldn't happen. Right. And. I, I, I just remember being thrown over their back and I could feel the whole thing. And I know that, you know, I'm slunched over, over, you know, over who I thought was like my grandfather, like his back. And so I'm trying to wake myself up during this because, you know, now I'm like, oh, my grandpa can wake me up type of thing. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm trying to do whatever I can to like uh, give off the clue that I'm struggling, like something is wrong. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I'm leaning over this back and I and I try I fight so hard I fought so hard I my eyes start flickering open and I'm like just you know I'm making I'm just about to see what's going on except my eyes don't open all the way they just flicker so lightly that I could it, you know it's like taking a almost like taking a picture when it like does it a thousand times in a couple seconds kind of thing that's what it was like and when I look down I couldn't see any legs at all. I was floating. I was floating in the air. And that's when I started to panic because I was able to do it long enough where I'm like, I knew what I was seeing and I knew that I was seeing no legs. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't just like having a couple glimpses here and there. It was like really fast glimpses where I was like able to see in a way. And I noticed there was no legs, dude. And I'm freaking out and I'm fighting so hard. The next thing I remember is I just gave up. Um, I, we got all the way down the staircase 
right? Took a right to go to my, my bathroom, which was downstairs. And as soon as we hit that kitchen, I was out. I, I just gave up and that was it. And I woke up the next morning on the floor in my bedroom, which oddly enough has happened probably a million times between me and my brother. My grandparents used to just tell us we fell off the bed. But if, if we had fallen off the bed, they, their room was right next to us. They would have heard that thump. You know what I mean? It's a big, you know, that's a body falling off a four, you know, five foot bed. Like they would have heard it. Uh, so I believe that they, every time we have these experiences, they would lay us back down on the floor because whoever was on the floor was always on the top bunk that night or the night before. And we would always end up on the floor somehow. I mean, sure, granted, you can explain that away. You can say, well, you just in your sleep climb down, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I've never slept walk in my life. I've never done any of that. So I don't really see how that adds up uh, to my life personally. Anyways, <clears throat> that's one of the experiences I had. And then I'm going to fast forward to when I was 19, and this was just after I got saved. This was probably like six months after I got saved. And my brother and I, if anybody else is, you know, knows the story, we got saved at the same time in a bedroom, and that's a whole other story. It's crazy. It's awesome. All glory to God. But like you guys were saying earlier, you know, I was, I was t that overwhelming feeling of love. Like I was touched by God's finger on my heart type of thing. We just, at the same time, my brother and I just broke down in tears and you know ugly crying and stuff you know <laughs> it was it was just incredible we knew that we knew that we knew that jesus christ was the truth um you know we gave our lives to him but anyways a couple months after that um i we weren't we stopped doing a lot of things like right away instantly god kind of cleansed us from a lot of uh, bad things uh, but a lot of some other things took some time and one of those was like getting high all the time like we were, we were straight potheads and I was I I ended up like eating a cookie or something, and at this point I I I didn't think about it, but I thought about it. Like I've thought about it before before this experience. I just didn't think about it in the moment that like I kept having this thought for I don't know that six months that like if I keep smoking, it's gonna open up a doorway for me. And I'm not saying that's like that for everybody. I know you know I have my own views on on cannabis, so I'm not not trying to get into that debate. You know. I believe there is good medical uses for it, and God created it. Um, but anyways, I'm not trying to go there with this. I'm just saying that I smoked a lot, and I did a lot of, like, dabs and cookies and stuff. So I ate an edible this one night, and I laid down to go to bed, and I, for the first time in six months, I, I had a uh, sleep paralysis experience, but... I knew it was coming, just like I always said, you know, like I, I could feel it coming on. I just knew it was going to happen, and I'm and I'm like, dang. So I go into this sleep paralysis experience, and th there's somebody, there's somebody in my room, and their hands are around my throat, and I, I, I just know this because I felt, ooh. Jeremy, we lose you? sounded like uh... my bad i dropped the mic dude okay oh uh, anyway so i knew it was coming on i felt like somebody was grabbing my throat and uh this is the first time again for context the first time i had sleep paralysis since i've been born again and at first i just start freaking out in my head because i can't I, you know i'm in my own room at this point this is years later so you know i'm in my own room i'm having this experience with nobody to help me and i start freaking out and then I just get this burst of courage and I said to myself in my head because I couldn't speak in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, leave this place, leave my house and get off of me. And as soon as I said that, dude, I snapped out of sleep paralysis for the first time in my whole life. This instantly came out of it. And I sat up and my bedroom door swings open. And I was like, just praising God, you know, I was so excited, and I'm like, yeah, you know what I mean, I wanted to tell everybody about it, well, fast forward a couple of years, that same night that I had sleep paralysis, my brother, my brother ended up having sleep paralysis, and he saw um, a goat, like a goat demon, walk into his room, and start standing at the end of his bed, and this whole thing is so my brother does the same thing in the name of Jesus, you know, get out of my house. And instantly for the first time in his whole <clears> life, <throat> he snaps out of it. 
right? And he's casting, you know, he's he's all pumped up now that he's out of it, and he's, like, casting his demon out of the house or whatever. And then his door swings open. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming either whatever was on me and attacking me first, I got out of it, called it, you know, I told it to leave. It went into my brother's room and did it to him. Or vice versa. And, and Josh, for the first time in his life, also saw for the first time, like, what this was, what was, he was struggling with all these years, you know, like, the, the thing actually manifested as a goat, like, a, if you think of a baphomet, that's what this thing looked like, is what my brother said. Now, I never saw it, but that same night, he saw it after his experience, or during his experience. So, yeah, those are my two stories for tonight. <laughs> Do you mind if I um read something really quick? from the uh, anti-Nicene Fathers about demons. Go ahead, dude. Because I, I, I wanted to read this, but I don't know how much longer I'm going to have. I just wanted to read the two quick quotes. Um, yeah, from, that's fine. I was going to say, we got to wind this down anyway. I, I It didn't go to the topic that I thought we were going to go to, but that's totally cool. Like, this was this is pretty awesome just being able to hear stories and tell stories. Um, but yeah, go ahead and read those quotes and we'll start winding it down. All right. Um, let's see. The first one is from Tatian and it's from the year 160 CE or AD, however you want to say it. Um, None of the demons possess flesh. Their structure is spiritual, like that of fire or air, and only by those who have the Spirit of God are they easily seen, but they are not seen at all by others. Now, that, you know, just because one of the anti Nicene fathers right it doesn't make it scripture but i i just thought I, uh, that and one other one i wanted to read because that's you know we see that is in the the like not even si maybe 60 years after um john died a little over 60 years after john died um let's see All right. The angels then who have fallen from heaven and haunt the air and the earth and are no longer able to rise to the heavenly things and the souls of the giants who are the demons who wander about the world, perform similar actions. So, and that was uh, Athenagoras in about the same time period. It was 175 uh, CE, AD, whatever you want to call it, when he wrote that. There's a lot more, but for time's sake, I'm not going to read them. But there's a whole part in the the dictionary of early Christian beliefs on demon activities and de demon possession. Um, there's a whole part on the worship of demons. The early church actually wrote quite a bit about the demonic realm. I know and, I gotta buy that book again, dude. Yeah, um, it's a it, it's really a good resource for people to be able to you know look into what the early church believed and taught without having to you know have a, a, a volume of encyclopedias like because the anti Nicene fathers is nine or ten volumes it's huge and. But this is, you know, the Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs is 
a reference guide to more than 700 topics that were discussed by the early church fathers. That's what it says on the front here. But, um, you know, it's, it's David Berceau edited it. So, you know, one of the best early church historians there is, if not the best, edited it. And, you know, I just wanted to read that, not to prove anything in any what one way or the other, just uh, to show what they were thinking about, first of all, where uh, demons came from. And there's uh, a quote that I didn't read that's right above that, that literally says, it quotes Genesis 6 for where they came from. Um, you know, it says that they are the spirits of the, the giants. So, I mean, that it wasn't until um, the several hundred years after Christ in the fourth or fifth century um, before any, that there were like, I think one of the anti-Nicene writers that I found that wrote something about um, the demonic realm that could be interpreted as them being fallen angels, but not really. And it was origin. And he, what he basically says is that demons are the disembodied spirits of men. Um, origin also said the humans were fallen angels too. So. And that's what, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that Origin says that is questionable at best. Um, he was influenced heavily by Stoic philosophy, and mm -hmm. that you know he had a a lot of. Um, beliefs and um, Eastern philosophy, things that came out of Zoroastrianism, Gnosticism, um, you know, the, the philosophers of Greece. So yeah, um, I take what Origen says with a grain of salt. But um, <clears throat> I was the one thing I read was just the thing that was talking about the basically what we had said earlier about there being different classes of um, fallen uh, entities, if you will. There are the the things we see in Ephesians six: principalities, powers, thrones, dominions. You know what one can do that another can't um i don't think there's really a way that we'll know that for sure um uh, this side of the kingdom of heaven um like actually going there not not the kingdom of heaven we're in but like until we reach the glorified body until we see jesus um until we're no longer looking through a, a glass bin. Uh, I think that it's pretty clear that we can speculate on it, but other than taking the word of the entities themselves on what they are, you know, there's, there's nothing for sure in script that says how to identify one fallen entity over another. Yeah, well, and and I would, you know, one of the things, and this kind of gets in, us into what we were going to be talking about tonight, which is um, eschatology, is one of the interpretations of, um, I want to say it's Revelation 13, but I could be wrong. Um, it is the story of the the dragon and the tail of the dragon um, bringing a third of heaven with him. Revelation 12, okay. Um, is that the, you know, some people 
have read that and think that it is a future um, event, which it could well be. Um, but there are others that believe that there have been uh, maybe at least two falls um, of the spiritual beings, whereas the Watchers being the first, and those spiritual beings for their sin, what they committed, um, Enoch confirms this, Bible confirms this, that, you know, they're, they are sent, uh, bound in chains to gloomy darkness in Tartarus. Whereas, um, when you look at the Revelation 12 story, this could be interpreted as, um, when the dragon is kicked out of heaven, as a result of uh, Christ's birth, and that uh, in that, that gives us our hierarchy of the demonic realm, and I use that term, um, where we have watchers that are not in Tartarus, but that are roaming the earth. The, that could be our principalities. All right, you know, your prince of Persia, your prince of Greece, your prince, and that they themselves are ruling over the um, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, who were a result of the the flood. You know, um, these are just these are just some some things that I've heard people talk about. To try to explain, to try to explain how these these entities are being able to do the things that they do. I I actually have said many times that Revelation twelve took place in the the first century. Um, I believe mm -hmm. that whole, um, but the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece, they Daniel, you know, long before mm -hmm. the first century. So, um. And Michael Heiser actually uh, does a good job, I think, of explaining how this could be um, in that uh, the Book of Enoch and I don't know if there's any other text besides the Book of Enoch outside of the Bible. The Bible gives the best evidence for there being um, 70 of the watchers that were not bound in Tartarus. Um, and, you know, he uses Deuteronomy 32 um, mm -hmm. and the, the Bible incident when, you know, the, the rest of the, right. when the nation were scattered. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you that, that Revelation 12, that the, there was, most definitely at least two um, excursions of angels coming down. Um, but I, I, and unless the, the principalities that were able to withstand uh, Gabriel so much that Mike come and help him were something other than uh, a being of equal you know, class as far as a fallen one. Mm -hmm. um, other than that interpretation, I don't know how it could be um, anything other than an angel. Uh, and, and so mm -hmm. it would have had to have been from an earlier uh, mm -hmm. fall. Well, and, and I think, you know, if we look at it from even a Psalms, uh, 82 perspective of the divine council. Um, the divine council was it's itself still seated in its seats when, um, when, and, and again, you can read this in, um, Heiser as well talks about this, the Old Testament in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, is you see the divine judgment of Jesus walking into the, the divine council and, and declaring judgment onto um those entities and, and you, so i mean you can see that even even if those are two occasions there's still a third of uh, set of angels that are in rebellion 
um, which are those 70, you know, which are that divine council um, there, um, the 70 or 72 um, nations that are a result at the, after the fall of Babel. So I think that, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think that to say that, you know, there, well, there's only demons, uh, the watchers are, you know, bound in gloomy darkness and, and Tartarus and all that kind of stuff, I think fails to take into consideration exactly what you were saying about the entity that is, you know, the Prince of Greece and the Prince of Persia that stood against Michael and Gabriel as they were trying to come. Um, you also, but you also have the story of Michael and Lucifer fighting over uh, Moses's body, and how does Michael win? Um, and this was yes, he, 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 he says the Lord rebuke you. Exactly, and so that's what we were talking about earlier. Is I mean, even even Michael didn't have the audacity that some of these deliverance ministries. Have. <laughs> You know, you know, Michael went, the Lord rebuked him, and that's how he won, you know. So I think, I mean, even in that situation, the name of the Lord is is pretty powerful. Absolutely. Well, Mr. John? Yeah, I guess uh, I guess we lost Jeremy. Um, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, I guess... Uh, see it in the chat um oh that's not okay yeah um i i don't feel up to getting into an eschatological discussion uh i'm still under the weather uh um, i guess i guess we should have everybody back on for that i know matthew marcel was supposed to, to join us and johnny bargo was supposed to join us um uh, for that um I guess, I guess in closing, um, I guess I'm going to sign off because I, I need to get some yeah. rest and some Same. sleep. Yeah. Um, uh, but w I, yes, uh, both Joe and, and Jeremy, where can, where can, um, where can, uh, um, uh, I guess you guys plug where everybody can find y'all. And thank you for definitely coming on by their fruits. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely. Jeremy, go ahead. All right. Um, well, you can, Find the Remnant Report and all of Kingdom Productions Network videos on the, the Kingdom Productions Network YouTube channel, which is just Kingdom Productions Network. And you can find my books um, on Amazon or um, Kindle if you want an ebook instead of the. Uh, paperback or hardcover um as well as uh, book, most bookstores there's probably smaller ones that don't have them but you could also listen to them for free if you want <laughs> they're they're also up on the our youtube channel but uh, thank you for having me it's always a nice, Jeremy. pleasure to come on with you guys man yeah, same here. Um, whenever y'all ready to have me on, great. I'd love to have you guys come on um, the Christian Underground podcast. We can get that going uh, maybe sometime this summer. That would be awesome. Um, but yeah, we uh, you can find the Christian Underground podcast on YouTube. Uh, it, again, it's just that simple. The Christian Underground podcast. Um, we're, we're, we're a fairly new podcast in the in podcasting world and we just dropped or we're dropping our 13th episode, um, this Sunday we we have, um, we have pastor, uh, Brandon Black, who's, we are talking about the cosmology of the ancients, or we're looking at, um, how the heavens declare the glory of God. And we're looking at the stars and the constellations and, and just discussing, um, just discussing that from a biblical perspective. All right. Yeah, definitely. Thank both of y'all for coming on. And, 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 and um, of course I know Jeremy would, would want to be here, but he had to go take care of something. And um, uh, from us to buy their fruits, uh, we love you uh, very much. And thank you for listening and God bless each and every one of you. 
Um, and take care until next time. Um,